Hey everybody, welcome to our annual Marine RV Pro Clinic webinar from Interstate. I'm Kyle Friedel. I put on our Pro Clinic webinars along with our team Mallory Metz and welcome Aspen Dietrich, the newest member to our team. They'll be taking us through Q&A at the end of this webinar. Uh, we're going to wait just a minute to let other people jump on. While we do that, I do want to do some housekeeping. Just let you know this webinar will be recorded. And as always, if you miss it or you want to hear other webinars, previous webinars, or, or forward it to um, your customers, we highly encourage that. That's part of why we're doing this is so that you can help your customers understand marine and RV batteries. But you can do that by going to interstatebatteries.com slash proclinic. Do want to have you open up the toolbar in your Zoom window. You'll see a Q&A tab down there and inside, inside the toolbar open up that Q&A tool and please put questions in there as we go. Uh, we are standing by to answer those questions. If they're easy layups, I might be able to help with a few of them. But the big ones we will save for the end and Jeff and Gail will go through those live. So go ahead and put those in there. Um, today I'll be going through a few industry insights. I'll try to do that in about five minutes and then Jeff and Gail are going to go through uh, what you need to know to help your customers make a more informed decision get the most life out of those batteries, including um, the difference between battery types, especially focusing on cycling batteries, because that's kind of the mystery. We're not used to those. We're used to starting batteries, right? So they'll go through that, how to get the most out of them, understanding how many you need, calculating their amp draw, things like that. So um, hang in for that, and uh, we'll kick it off in just a second here. Okay, so what we're looking at is a couple surveys from the RV Institute of America as well as customer surveys from Interstate Batteries. What this one indicates is new vehicle shipments in the U.S. markets and as you can see boats went up and down a little bit in the 20, uh, 20 teens, uh, down a bit in 2020 obviously at the beginning of COVID but then back up and strong in 2021. Uh, and RVs similarly were a bit on the decline at the end of the 20 teens and then COVID hit and people wanted to get out, right? People needed extra space. Um, sometimes it was officing from home, sometimes it was quarantining, but they wanted to get away and RVs made a great uh, path for that. And as you can see, 2021 sales just blew away anything in the past. So the implication there is that here, here we are in 2023, those batteries, a lot of them are factory built, they came with the equipment, might've been sitting on a lot for a bit, um, those are going to need to be replaced starting this year and next. And you want to make sure that you are stocked with batteries uh, and, a, and a rack of batteries so that you can help your customers get back out on the road. Another quote I want to use from Dave Folk, CEO of Boat Manufacturer Brunswick. The big question for them is keeping all these new buyers in boating. It's a very similar audience to RVing, so I think the same implication rings true. We need to provide a positive experience for them. Everything from the purchasing experience in, at your dealerships to the experience they have out on the road. So you want to make sure that they've got batteries that have a true nationwide warranty. But the interstate warranty is covered by over 250 distributors around the country, thousands and thousands and thousands of dealers where a, a person who's traveling could go and get their battery replaced should they ever have any problems. That's all part of a positive experience. And then um, some more studies that talk to us about who is buying batteries. And what's what's interesting is is more than ever, uh, it's it's a younger audience. This this 33 year old is the median age. The millennial group it now owns 58 percent of RVs out on the road. And and if you look to the right, you can see that they they're willing to pay money for those RVs, right? They're they're paying more than than all the other audiences. So it's important that we really provide them a positive experience, right? These guys are going to be, if they're having a good experience and they're coming back, they're going to be buying multiple RVs or boats from you. And so again, even down to the, you know, the, the purchasing experience, but the battery that you put in that vehicle could make a difference. Something else to know about the battery, uh, the boat customer in particular, but also marine uh, RV customers, I should say, uh, most of them replace their batteries proactively. 55% will do that as part of regular maintenance. And that is almost unheard of when you compare it to automotive batteries. Only about 23% will proactively replace their car battery. And most of this, this audience will do the work themselves. They are DIYers. So 
Again, the implication there is that it's important for you to have a rack of replacement batteries in your showroom, have POP, have signage, and that's all stuff that Interstate can provide you if you don't already have that. 37% of Americans either own an RV or intend to own an RV. What matters to these, these folks? And the features that they want, this is also important for you know, the implications to your business, they want a generator, they want house batteries, they want solar panels. Those are the top three things. Uh, and and if, even if you look at the next one, a composting toilet, that all tells us that they want to be able to go where there are not hookups. They're not gonna be able to plug into power or water. Um, they want to go off grid and that means more battery storage capability. They want to be able to live without having to plug in and, and get really get away. Um, so let's look at marine battery product attributes that consumers are willing to pay more for. This is a survey of about 600 boat owners. The number one thing is a long lasting battery. That makes sense. They want high quality. They want a brand they can trust. They want a long warranty. They want amp hours, especially in that cycling battery. What that tells us is we sometimes think that customers just want the cheapest price, but what they're really looking for is value, right? They value their time away and they're willing to pay more to not have to deal with the hassle of a battery replacement. They're, they're willing to pay more for their experience, right? This is their vacation time. So if you'll notice, price isn't even on there. And I'd like to say that Interstate Battery pretty much checks all the boxes on there. So we'll, uh, we'll dive in more on the details of that with Gail and Jeff. But speaking of Jeff and Gail, want to introduce them with a combined battery automotive shop, shop owning experience of, man, we may be over 100 years now, but close to 100 years of experience. So they really know their stuff. Um, I think Gail even invented the battery. But anyway, Jeff, Gail, thanks for joining us. How are you guys doing today? Guys, we're doing great. It's good to be here. Every day, above ground Every is day. always good. Absolutely. So today we are going to go over kind of the, the battery basic stuff, right? Yes. We're going to talk about the different types and the chemistries. We're also going to talk about ant draw. Because when we look at these and, and how they you gotta kind of match your battery banks together with what you're using, very, very important. And one key thing, battery maintenance. So let's just start out with the battery types. As we look at batteries, I mean, yes, you've got group sizes that are 24s, 27s, 31s, whatever. There is a huge difference in a starting battery versus a deep cycle battery. Starting batteries, you got a quick burst of energy that is just done for a few seconds to be able to crank up whatever yeah. it is you're cranking up. So that is, uh, it's a different design. The plates are totally different than what you would see for a deep cycle. Yeah. So. We keep that in consideration when we're looking at the battery for this application. Now, we deal a lot with the marine RV industry and the marine side of it, we look at marine cranking amps. So marine cranking amps, we know is done at 32 degrees, all right? A lot of these new boat motors that are out there require X amount of amperage. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a CCA value, look at that motor and see what it's actually calling for. Because if you don't match that, with what that boat's requiring, you could run into a situation where this thing, we call it freewheeling. So it, the engine's just spinning and spinning and spinning and it sounds like it's got a lot of power, but the voltage and the amperage is not lining up to what it needs because it'll need to see X amount to be able to kick the injectors and the fuel pump in. Yeah. So we gotta make sure that we're looking at the OE specs yeah. and putting that battery in there that we need. So keep that in mind. Yes. Now there's a difference in that versus the CCA. Cold cranking amps is done at zero degrees. Marine cranking amps is done at 32 degrees. So there's a big difference there. Uh, when you look at starting and then deep cycle, once again, we're talking about two different um, builds in the quality. So we need to make sure that you're understanding what battery goes into what application because of that different build quality. If you're looking at just a cranking battery and that's all you need, that's really all you need. Uh, there are dual purpose batteries out there. There are deep cycle, but you gotta utilize it for what you're gonna be using it for. If you got a lot of accessory loads on there, yeah, you definitely gotta have a deep cycle. So we need to make sure that we're understanding the customers when they're coming in to purchase, and that way we can sell them the right battery and they don't come back six weeks later going, uh, this thing ain't working. They're too, the batteries are becoming too high, too expensive to make yes. mistakes like that. Yep. Use the correct battery for the purpose and functionality that you need. Exactly. 
also when we talk about maintenance free for example a maintenance free battery we're not talking about that it will recharge itself we're just talking about that you're not the addition of water bingo exactly so we, we look at this starting versus deep cycle once again and with the deep cycle batteries uh, that's a big difference there Gail I'm gonna let you kind of walk into that one and explain as Jeff was talking about battery type, starting versus deep cycle, and the differentiation between some of those and functionality, even going back to manufacturing. They manufacture a battery based on either starting or deep cycle or a mixture of the two. But anyway, so cycling or deep cycle batteries, a cycle, for example, to explain, a cycle is one discharge and one complete recharge of that battery. So does it, it matter what depth of discharge or is it just? It makes a great deal of difference because the deeper you discharge, the less amount of cycles you're gonna get out of that battery. For example, if I go consistently all the way down on a battery, that was an old myth that people used to talk about, possibly your granddaddy talked about that was or mine. your daddy. Let's get this battery and let's discharge it all the way down. No, because you're going to find that you can double, triple those amount of cycles if you don't go below 50% depth of discharge on that battery. And we've got an illustration of that going down to a, a low state of charge there to 100% depth of discharge. That doesn't mean you need to, that's just a illustrating the depth of discharge. Don't go below 50% on the batteries. So each time batteries. you use it, you really need to charge it. Exactly. Whether you went 10% or 50% or heaven forbid 100% depth of discharge, each time you discharge it, you need to recharge it back. That, that's because that a, makes a complete cycle in that situation. If you don't recharge it effectively, you haven't completed one cycle yet. So. Anyway, some of the things that we are going to talk about are specifications, ratings, different things of marine RV batteries. We know reserve capacity, we've explained that. It's on the label of the battery. It's a discharge of 25 amps, starting at a full set of charge down to at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 26.7 degrees Celsius. It's discharging that battery down to a point of 10.5 volts and then uh, for amount of minutes in that situation. Ampere hours is a kissing cousin to reserve capacity. <laughs> I, at least I say that, right? <laughs> anyway, ampere hours are the amount of amps and hours that you can discharge a battery at 80 degrees because remember, cold temperatures change that amount of rating. So I want to throw in a real quick one here. Yes. So we talk about reserve capacity so for years, that's always been known as emergency power, especially on the starting batteries, because it's trying to get you somewhere safe if you were to have an alternator or a, a belt or whatever break. Um, so that's, it's always been known as, you know, that's emergency power to get you somewhere. Yes, it is that or has been in that situation, you're on a starting battery type situation on your vehicle, the alternator quits functioning or the belt breaks or whatever, you, the amount of time you can get to some service station or garage yeah. or whatever. Number of is. minutes. Number of minutes to get you there. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Some of the common mistakes and misunderstandings that we see constantly by uh, our customers is, does a deep cycle battery really need a break in time? Yes. That is a yes. It When you buy that or purchase that battery, exercise it a little bit to get your peak performance. I've had people, and Jeff has, where they call in and say, well, I put my battery in and it doesn't do all that I wanted it to do. I've only had it a couple of weeks. Uh, yes, and so sometimes it takes as much as 50 cycles to actually reach peak performance in that battery. And remember also one of the things that we've heard many, many times, Jeff, is towing vehicle, the battery, the alternator's at the front. Will it charge my battery at the on my trailer? Uh, it has too far to go and it's gonna lose voltage uh, during that pressure availability. It can't do it. it. It may get some slight amount, but not what it's supposed to. If you discharge that towing vehicle battery, 
it can't recharge it at all. In fact, it, an alternator is not a recharger in that situation. Yeah, so, it's not a true charger. Yeah, not a true charger. And, you know, not charging the battery in off season, you know, I put it up, I get through with it, I, I go fishing, I'm tired when I come home, I take the battery out because it's the end of the season, it's gonna be winter, so I just put it in the garage and I forget about it. And then when it gets spring again, I wanna get ready and go fishing. And so I go get the battery and put it in, lo and behold, it's discharged. Charge the battery in off season, maintain it. Get a battery charger that's gonna be smart and gonna charge it, not overcharge it, but charge that battery during, during the off season. That's exactly right. And one of the main things is people get frustrated with, upset, and some of the mistakes is under-specking and deep, the deeply discharging batteries that they placed in. They have two batteries and they think, these two batteries should take care of all of my needs, and they've got a lot of accessories on there, and under-specking that. Make you sure we're gonna go over that. Yes, we will. We will go over that in depth. And so, uh, you know, Jeff, some of the things that we there have been changes in batteries over the last few years during, -uh. during your tenure <laughs> and especially during mine in that situation. We, we have our traditional flooded batteries, the SLIs, uh, starting lighted and ignition, uh, but we also have AGM, absorbed glass mat. So when we look at the AGM batteries, they're a little bit more costly than what a traditional flooded yes. is, uh, but we got kind of two different variables in there. We've got a alloy AGM, which is a recycled lead, but then we've also got pure lead they do function differently and as far as lifespan there's a big difference so you're looking at the quality of a an alloy agm and yeah it's it's kind of pricey uh but then you go to the the pure lead product and it's a lot more expensive but you do get a lot more life cycles out of them uh, then guess what we throw in another one we're, we're looking at lithium so lithium is a it's another astronomically high battery now there are a lot of good features which we'll kind of go over that as well but we also, we throw in another lead acid battery in here, and it's the EFB, it's the Enhanced Flooded Battery. There's a lot of different features that are in this battery that kind of make it just almost perform like an AGM. And yes. that's, that's unbelievable. Now, we got some really high cycles that are going on with these now, and there's a lot of additives in there, like we've got a, uh, a reinforced positive strap, we've also got the graphite additive in there, so why, why would we have graphite in there? Well it lets his battery operate at a partial state of charge, and that's unbelievable. That's great. We also have what we call a scrim, which it's, it's like a fiber mesh that goes onto the positive plate. Now, why would we do that, Gail? Well, one of the things that we would do that for is to help hold, reinforce that positive paste material, not to flake off, not, so it goes longer, much longer on the cycles. That's why we call it, one of the reasons we call it an enhanced flooded, flooded battery. battery, exactly. So we've got performance, like we said, it's almost like an AGM, uh, unbelievable. So then we also have two times the cycle life of your traditional flooded battery. Correct. We also get a extended warranty now, so we got a two year warranty. That's you know unbelievable on a flooded battery. Now we also, this is listed as a true maintenance free. Now when we talk maintenance free, like Gail was saying earlier, maintenance free means maintenance free you can't get in there to add water there's no way to do it now that doesn't mean you don't have to charge it you gotta charge it batteries Always. don't just rejuvenate overnight by no. themselves no the air doesn't it doesn't bring it in there no bring. no now let's go in a little bit deeper now and talk about our agm product gail let's do a cutaway type situation on an agm battery for example if we're looking at this pictorial here we see a situation of this gray framework there. That's the what we call the lead grid, the framework that's there, the start of a battery, the lead framework. And then paste material is added to that. This paste material is that chemical that's gonna allow it to function and work in life, expansion. Lead dioxide and sponge lead. Exactly, and so, also, the negative, when we call this negative plate, we're talking about both those put together, lead framework and then the paste material. So now it becomes a different name, 
because it now is a negative plate. Now, then we go to the next one, the white material there, the glass mat. Now this glass mat, absorbed glass mat, that's where AGM gets its name, is when they pour the uh, liquid electrolyte in, it absorbs all of this, this white material absorbs 99.9% .9 of this, um, this liquid electrolyte. Think about a diaper and how absorption, how absorbing those are today because of technology. Anyway, and so the glass mat absorbs all of that and then the positive plate. So you have the glass mat sandwiched between the negative and positive and that is hosting the liquid electrolyte and holding it in place so that you only have an oxygen recombination. Therefore, gassing is done away with as far as that is concerned. Zero or virtually zero gas. As long as you got the right charger on it. Yes. <laughs> Don't overcharge it. Yeah. So, Gail, in this, in this case, these are almost like a true uh, dual purpose, right? Yes. And, and that's always a good thing. And you can also get kind of two times a life. Mm -hmm. Two to which three. Is, yeah, is really unbelievable. And believe it or not, they're vibration resistance. Now, why would that be? Because everything is sandwiched in there, so tightly compressed? They have a compression when they are building this battery. It compresses that so tightly that you can shake. We do a lot of vibration tests. Yes, yes. we do a lot of, y'all do a lot of vibration tests and uh, make sure that it, functions to that capability without falling apart and it does it does a great job and these are like you said a minute ago they are a maintenance free a true maintenance free when we talk about you can't add water to these and I do want to I want to draw in a little bit on this one too we do have some AGM batteries out there that looks like the caps do do twist off please if it says AGM on it that is a, you don't open that up. It's non-accessible. So don't make, unscrew it. Yeah, make sure you tell your customers about that. This may look like that. You you can take them off. Do not do that no. because air going into those plates and the absorbed glass material will deteriorate it rapidly. Yeah, so don't, don't try to add water. No. Now, AGM batteries do charge a lot faster than what a traditional flooded battery does. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Now, they are susceptible to overcharge. Now, there are pressure relief valves within these batteries. So keep in mind, every, uh, every battery's got to have a venting system, period. Uh, if they didn't, they would swell to the point where then they would be what we call a rapid disassembly. Yes. They're going to come apart. So keep in mind, you've got to use the right charger for the chemistry that you're dealing with. So AGM has got to have the AGM charging on it. So make sure the charger is correct for that. Now, I wanna go into this lithium because there's a lot of misconceptions about lithium out there. So back in the day, this is a few years ago, when we were talking about lithium, one of the things that always stuck in my mind was the airplane incident where the lithium ion battery caught fire. Yes. And so every time I, I kept hearing about lithium, I'm like, I don't wanna test that. Yes. Well, it's I've been volatile. testing. Yeah, I've been testing lithium product here in the lab now for over three years, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a lithium phosphate. So it's a different chemistry. Yes. Uh, even though it's lithium, it's still a different chemistry out there. And these have been. Uh, it's just unusual, or not unusual. It's unbelievable how they transformed over the years to make these things work. So they've got a onboard what we call battery monitoring system. We call it BMS because you know we're into acronyms. So battery monitoring system is actually looking at these individual cells within that, that battery itself, and it's keeping everything balanced because if it's not equalized, that's a problem, and especially with any kind of lithium. Once they get out of balance, they could actually have a thermal runaway, which these BMSs on board are looking at that. Now, they are awesome as far as the longest lifespan of a battery. I mean, these things have the capability of taking it down to 100%, and recharging it back, and you can do this for thousands of cycles. Instead of hundreds. Ex yeah, exactly. So when we look at that, keep in mind that that battery monitoring system is also keeping the protection there where it will not let it under discharge and it will not let it overcharge. There's parameters set within that thing that keep it from doing that, which is unbelievable. So it's not only monitoring, it's helping to stabilize that battery Bingo. to not overheat, not, and, but also to function properly. Yes, yes. 
Now, that is the most expensive battery that's out there for sure. Right. Now, there are some drawbacks on lithium. Lithium does not like cold weather, kind of like Gail and I. We don't like cold. That's why we live here. Yeah, well, and today it's it started out at 34 degrees. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like that either. But lithium batteries, they do offer some of these with a uh, an internal heater that will keep the battery warm. Now, and they, they can function in lower temperatures. However, keep in mind that that internal unit is also pulling from the battery. The pack. And anything that heats draws more power. That's exactly right. So we, we got to keep that in mind. Now, when we, we want to talk a little bit, you know, because we're, we're trying to go through this and get as much information to you guys as we can, I want Gail to kind of hit on basically how we understand the battery ratings on these and what we need as far as performance. Absolutely. You know, you have customers come in and they're, they've got hundreds if not thousands of questions for you. And they've got this amount of batteries and they want to know about all these different things and functionality and, and how long it's gonna last and et cetera, et cetera. You know this. How cheap can I buy them too? <laughs> yeah. But some of the things, we have a chart here that talks about, for example, if I have lights on, I'm utilizing lights, and we're talking about amp hours here. Amps, the amount of discharge, I mean, amount of amps, current drawn from the battery, plus or times the amount of hours, amper hours. And so in this, we're showing or illustrating some of the uh, estimating battery needs in that scenario. For example, lights, we have lights that are drawing, so many lights on this that are drawing five amps. And we're gonna utilize these for five hours, well, that's simplistic in that we multiply those two and we have 25 amper hours. Well, we have fish locator and we go one amp for five hours in that situation. We have a trolling motor drawing 10 amps times five hours. And so we have all these and we add them up, 25, five and 50, and so we have 80 amper hours. That's important to know. So we have 80 amper hours. Now let's figure out what we're going to do with this 80 amper hours, how we're going to supply that properly for the customer. Well, first of all, let's double that amount. Why would you want to double it? Well, because we don't want to go below 50% oh, depth of discharge. Yeah. Very important. So make sure you help the customer understand this, that that's why if you have an 80 amper hour, you want battery supplying 160 amper hours. Gail, I want to throw something in there. Sure. You know, we have this fish finder in here at one amp. We've got screens out there now that are 10 and 16 inch screens monitoring all this. Now we're seeing amp draws anywhere from two and a half up to seven amps. That's so, like watching movies. It <laughs> is. I guess you're watching all the fishies. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Screaming. We've got some elaborate ones out there trying to Screaming. see them. <laughs> trying to see the fish and catch them. Yeah. So, yes. They have some elaborate systems out there. Make sure you understand this very important aspect of it. I reiterating, we've got 80 amp hours that we totaled up, but we need 160 amp hours at least that much of battery power so that we don't go below 50% depth of discharge. What if we only have an RC rating, Gail, and there's no amp hour? Well, we take an RC Right, and that's an important reserve question. Reserve capacity. Reserve capacity. You see it on the label and it says, I've got reserve capacity, I've got 100 minutes reserve. Take that 100 minutes and multiply that times 0.6 to get an estimated amount of amper hour. So in that case, 100 times 0.6 is only gonna be 60 amper hours. Obviously, you can't use that to run that 80 amper hours. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> you know, one of the things that we find out we go to buy an appliance or we go to buy a device is that it's in, rated in AC watts. AC watts is 120 volts. Yep. And so we're dealing with a 12 volt battery. So How do we do that conversion then? We have to have a formula, obviously. We always have a formula. So you're telling me we're going back to math class. Yeah, we have to go back to math Dang class it. for just a moment. Okay, Gail, you said math class. So let's kind of do some math on our whiteboard here. So let's talk about the typical power consumption. And we're gonna do this really simple math here. So our appliance in this case is gonna be an LCD TV. And this thing will be pulling 200 AC watts. 
So what we want to do here is approximate the battery amper hour at 12 volts because we're not 120, we're on a 12 volt DC side. So in this case, one hour is going to equal 18.3 DC amps because we're taking that TV at 200 watts and dividing it by 12. Now, our AC watt conversion here, pretty simple as well. We start with the AC watts of accessories because that's what we'll always have as accessory loads. And we'll take that and we'll divide it by 12 because it's a 12 volt system. And we are always gonna have a power loss. So times 1.1 for your power loss through the inverter. Always remember, there is a power loss in there. And we'll take that times the number of hours we're wanting to run this piece of equipment. Now our example, 200 watt TV divided by 12 because now we're into a 12 volt DC. So we're gonna come up with 16.6 .6 DC amper hours that we need times 1.1 because of our voltage loss through that inverter. So now we're gonna come up with 18.3 DC amps that we need, amper hours. And we take that, our initial one over here was for one hour, so now we're gonna take that up. So we're gonna times it by two hours that we're gonna be watching this TV, and we come up with a end total of 36.6 .6 amper hours that we need. Now, keep in mind, that's taking the battery down to 100% depth of discharge if that's all you have. We wanna keep that at 50% depth of discharge to keep the battery cycle life where it needs to be. So we'll take that and times it by two to offset for that 50% depth of discharge. And we'll end up with 73 amper hours that we need to be able to run this piece of equipment for that two hours we needed. So you can go higher on your, your amper hour bank. That's no big deal. That kind of helps out on the cycle life of the battery itself. So once again, simple math to kind of make it easier to understand how we come up with these different power consumptions. In that situation, we have several devices that we might utilize. For example, we have that LCD uh, TV that we're using, and, and we've got uh, a satellite dish, and we've got a refrigerator, and we've got a coffee maker, and we've got we've got a coffee maker. Oh, you gotta and have that. That's important. That definitely gotta have that. And then we've got light bulbs. And we got blow dryers if we're married. And anyway, or yeah, I can anyway, tell you right now that we got my dryer. wife's higher than twelve hundred. Yes, so we got a blow dryer. Anything that heats takes a lot, a lot of, of power. power. So you're looking at a chart, or looking at a chart, for example, in this situation, and we see, okay, we've got a total amount of of all of this is eighteen point six plus 4.6 plus 14, all these different amounts that we're adding up as we add these devices. And then we go with- I need okay, a lot of batteries. Yeah, a whole lot of batteries. A whole lot more batteries. And so we add all of these up, we have 200 and some odd amper hours. Now think of the batteries. And we said, remember, 50% depth of discharge. So we have to double that amount. Well, so we've got our series of parallel connections now. They are different. Uh, if you are replacing batteries within a unit and you see all these different wires going every different direction, take a picture or draw you out a diagram on how these things are hooked up because if they're in series, that's, that's pretty easy because you're taking a battery and you're taking uh, one positive on the one battery number one and you're hooking it to the negative on battery number two. So that's series connection. So what happens when we put batteries in series, Gail? When we put batteries in series, we increase the voltage capability, but the amperage doesn't go up. So our capacity so doesn't. So our capacity of that battery doesn't increase in that situation. As an example, we would have 24 volts, but only maybe two of these batteries, one being 80 amper hours, another being 80 amper hours. We've got a total of 80 amper hours at 24 volts. So explaining that to your, your consumers are really a big plus. Uh, parallel, hooking those up, I mean, that, that does what, Gail? Keeps it in 12 volts? Yes, you get 12 volts, but you get to double or increase, I should say, the amount of amper hours. If you have two 80 amper hour batteries and places in parallel, you should get a maximum of 160. Yeah. That's, but only at 12 volts. Right. now. That's, that's pretty simplistic there because we know what we're doing on one battery. Uh, if we're putting them one in a series, we know how that's gonna work out. We know what they're gonna do in a parallel. 
but what if I got a whole bunch of batteries that I want to hook together and it could be a series parallel connection? You know, you and I have dealt with this uh, consistently and we've been in situations where they've had 12, 15, 18 batteries across a, in a, in a motorhome type situation. And if you're going to be dealing with that, trying to replace or trying to do anything with those batteries, take your cell phone, take a picture of how they're connected. Because if you start disconnecting and you think you've got the sharpest mind in the world, believe me when I say, you're going to get confused when you start back putting them together. Yeah, and I, I would rather feel comfortable hooking them back up uh, after I've got a drawing or a picture because series parallel connections, one wrong move can actually cost you a inverter, a charger, uh, and a whole bunch of wiring because if it's connected the wrong way, you could have a meltdown and that's that's not ideal. No, meltdowns anybody. are not good in no, batteries. Not at all. So make sure that when we're doing these connections, we put them in there, we do them the correct way. We want to also make sure that we don't over tighten. That, exactly. that can cause you a, a big issue. Now, you know, you can typically go tight and then kind of do a quarter turn on it and you're, you're pretty much set. We do have torque specs that we will talk about here in just a little bit on what the proper torques are for those. Do we have bubble torques versus? Yeah, we, we, we have to go regulation by that torques. torques. Yeah, yeah. Bubble torques can really get you in trouble. So we want to make sure that we don't have any voltage drops. So make sure that your cables are the same size. Uh, hopefully we're not going 20 feet, you know, from one bank to the other. Correct. So we want to make sure we got the right cables on there Length as well. Length of cable. Yes. Proper size cable. Yes, exactly. Now, Gail, cycling batteries. You were talking about this just a little bit earlier. When we look at cycling, uh, these do have a break-in period. Now, most of our batteries are deep cycle. These things can take anywhere from 25 to 50 cycles to get broke in. Well, why is that? They're not fully formed when they're manufactured. And they're not fully formed for a reason yes. so that the customer can get the longevity out of those longer period of time. Exactly. Yes. And we also, you keep reiterating this and I'm glad you are, we talk about 50% depth of discharge. As you start going lower on depth of discharge, you start increasing the heat uh, resistance comes into play there. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that, that we're educating everybody about not going below that 50%. So. Uh, these seasonal users on these that are, you know, we've got downtime where they're storing them. There's a lot of things that come into play when you're uh, going to store one. And Gail, you know, we, we want to make sure that everybody understands that. If you use this battery, charge it after you're done. Charge it before you put it in storage because you still have a self-discharge that will be taking place. So we do recommend that every couple of months you go out and you put a boost charge back on them. Uh, also, one thing to really point out, these things, the travel trailers, they have a carbon monoxide sensor that uh, is pulling from the battery at all times. Even Safe. with a battery disconnect, yeah, it's the safety aspect, even with the battery disconnect switch, you turn it off, it's still pulling from the battery. So it's only, you know, about 750 milliamps, but over time, that'll calculate up to where to pull that battery way down. And then when you go back in to charge it, that's a lot of heat that you're creating because of that low depth of discharge. So, so you've got self-discharge of the battery, plus you're adding that discharge of that, of that yes, sir. device that's pulling the battery down. Yes, sir. So, you know, every couple of months, go out and charge that battery back up fully. Yes. All right. That's way you're charge. taking care of it. Yes, absolutely. That's very important. Maintaining. You know, we've got so many chargers and different things out there selection and we know that making sure that you get the proper charger for the proper battery. Why don't you elaborate yeah. a little bit on that? So for every hundred amp hour battery you've got, you really need twenty amps. And that and make sure that it's matching with the battery chemistry. That's the key. Uh, this way you can actually bring the battery up uh, to a hundred percent state of charge in a relevantly good amount of time. And you're you're basically taking care of the battery, making it happy. We, we want happy batteries. Now, there are a lot of smart chargers out there, or automatic chargers, that will go through and do the bulk charging and absorption, and it brings the battery up at a slow uh, pace to be able to get it up to 100%, and it does it at a, uh, a constant rate through the first stage, and then it'll kind of taper it off. 
but it does it to where it's not, number one, overheating the battery, as long as it's the right charger, and it's doing it to where once it goes at 100%, it'll go into a maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. So that, that's always a good thing. Uh, if you got a, a charger that's got selector modes for flooded or AGM, make sure you use the right uh, setting on it to, to get the right you know, amperage going in. And it's very important when you, when you have, and Jeff talked about it there just a few moments ago, you can utilize a 20 amp charger for a 100 amp hour battery. You don't want to go too high, obviously, so you want to maximize that maximum of 20 amps per 100 amp hour battery. But you can also get too small trying to put a charger on there that's going to take so long. It, it may charge it, but it's going to take so long. So it depends on your time factor mm -hmm. and when you're going to utilize it, etc. So you can yep. use the right charger for the right chemistry and use the right charger. Yeah. In so you've got, you've got your uh, trickle chargers and you got a maintainer. Yes. Got to watch that too. Because they're wattage charger. regulated. Trickle chargers mean what it says, trickle. Yeah. It's just going to maintain what you've got. If you've got a discharge, it's not going to charge it. It's going to maintain whatever you have. So if we're using our chargers and, and we're testing batteries and all that, we always start out with PPE. And that's personal protection equipment. So make sure you got your gloves and your glasses. Yeah. Check water levels on these things. Uh, that way you know for sure they're where they need to be. You're exactly right. In charging deep cycle batteries, it's very important. Again, as Jeff said, get a smart charger. It has multiple stages in it that help protect the battery, but yet get it charged up to a specific level of 100% state of charge or very near it. And so, for example, it's going to, in a bulk stage, it's going to power, put a lot of power, a lot of current into the battery at first to try to bring it up and see if the battery is going to accept it. And then the second stage, once it reaches a certain voltage level inside, then it's going to the battery reach a certain voltage. It's going to automatically go into the second stage, which is an absorption stage. It tapers that current uh, quite a bit. And so the first bulk stage, you may actually put 75% of the, the need of the battery performance in capacity back into it. It goes into absorption. Absorption is so important because it's not going to overheat the battery. It's tapering that current down. And then the last one is float, where it floats it to try to maintain and get that last few percent into the battery. Uh, another thing is, is that we checking the battery to make sure it's going to accept the charge properly. Watch that because it's going to make a difference. For example, we deal with batteries all the time that has one weak or bad cell within it, and it's not going to perform to the level. If you, exactly. Let's say you have a 600 CCA battery, and it will only bring it up to four. Well, guess what the performance of that battery will be? Four. It will never reach anything above that weakest cell within that battery. And if you're getting a lot of heat in that, I mean, that's resistance pushing back. Yeah. So that, that heat is going to create some gassing that might smell like rotten egg smell. Yeah. Uh, so when we look at our connections, this is one thing that really comes into play. Keep in mind, your charger is basically what's going to keep that battery performing. And we want to make sure that when we're hooking up the charger itself, and especially on these uh, marine chargers or even these on the travel trailer, put the charger leads on the lead pad first. Now, you've got the pictures that you're seeing here on the screen. That is very, very important because you could have 50 amps, 60 amps, 100 amps going back into that battery. It needs to be able to go through into that battery and not through a bunch of resistance like eyelet connectors. Those eyelet connectors can be from your accessory loads. We want to make sure that that charger lead is on there first because that is basically the heart of what's going to keep that thing going. Going against that lead pad is the purest and the least amount of resistance, resistance in that battery going lead to in that it's connecting directly inside the battery. So very important, as Jeff just talked about, high stamps, put that on first, that charger, etc. Put your accessory leads on last. We've we've had so many situations. In fact, Jeff has some pictures of things that he's dealt with in batteries that are very negative, let's say. 
<laughs> Very good. So there's no positive part about that. No. <laughs> so when we look at this, we always talk about torque specs too. I mean, that is, as Gail was talking a little bit earlier about Bubba specs, Bubba specs can be a, a very taunting, just to say the least. It, it can be very bad. If you over torque these things, and keep in mind, these studs that you see on these batteries are basically inverted bolts that yeah. are molded into that lead pad. Stainless steel studs. Yes, yeah. so they're, they're just designed to be able to hold that eyelet to the lead pad. When you start over torquing, you're pulling that, that bolt up from that lead pad, so now you've got a gap. Well, that gap is gonna create resistance. And the picture that we have on the screen is what can result with that when you're not doing the proper torque specs. So we've outlined this on this page to where you understand when we're looking at torque specs, we are really being very important and mindful of having that on there. So on the 516, you're you know anywhere from 120 to 100. Uh, 40 inch pounds. Yes. The 3 8 studs, we actually do 120 to 180 inch pounds. Yes. Not foot pounds, folks. Not foot pounds. It's inch pounds. Yes. So we've been doing a lot of questions throughout this seminar uh, to kind of, you know, help out at the end. We do want to go to live Q&A now to where if you've got something that uh, is just weighing on you and you didn't get to put it in the chat, we're going to be able to answer those questions now. So let's let's feel free to do that. All right, so this is going to kick off our live Q&A portion. If you guys have any questions, go ahead, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A tool. Um, now is your chance to get those in. Um, I think we've got a couple queued up for Jeff and Gail to answer, so you guys have some time to type out your questions. Jeff, I noticed there's a question here actually in the chat box that we haven't gotten around to answering yet, so we can start there. The question goes, what effect does using a smaller solar powered trickle charge have on boat batteries? Does it change the quote cycles a battery will have? Trickle chargers are very common on trailered boats. Any maintenance tips for batteries on boats in salt or brackish water conditions? So, man, that's a bunch of questions in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So on the solar powered uh, trickle charger, no big deal. As far as cycles, uh, it's not like you're you're discharging it to any real depth of discharge. You're, I mean, you're basically just trying to keep power going into it to keep the acid moving around. So as far as you know, taking out cycles, now I wouldn't consider that uh, a big deal at all. Um, they, um, I would say on your ones for the the salt water and all, man. You know, we were talking just a few minutes ago in there about the uh, corrosion and everything that can get on battery terminals. That's that's one big key thing to watch out for, especially uh, in that type of situation. You've definitely got to keep them clean. Uh, and with salt water, it, it will definitely create sulfation a lot faster. So, you know, key thing is monitor them, check water levels, uh, keep the connectors clean, keep them tight. Um, anything else you want to add on that, Gail? I think we still have Gail. He's on. He's. I'll see if we can get him to unmute. Oh, I'm. I'm good now. Hey. Uh, yes, you want to make sure that you use a good protectron after you get all the cables connections on there, completely tight, et cetera, or where they're supposed to be inch pounds, and then put some protectron on there. You don't want that salt air. It will go quite fast to corrosion from salt. I hope that helps to answer the question that we had. But yes, salt air is terrible on cables, connections, metals of any kind. And you know, if you're a saltwater fisherman, how much it can even affect anything on that boat with regard to probe. Awesome. Thank you for the input on that one, Gail. We'll go ahead and move through. I see there's some questions coming in on the Q&A box. Timothy here has asked, is there a manual that can be downloaded slash printed with this information that he can share with his team? Do you want me to answer well, that one, Jeff? I was going to say, I'm going to let you answer that because you've got all <laughs> the connections now. Uh -uh. 
Yep. Um, Timothy, yes, we can definitely share out um, this presentation with you. If that's something you're interested in, you can email us at proclinics at idsa.com. Additionally, if you'd rather give your team some additional context, or if you'd like them to, to watch this webinar themselves, uh, you can share this link um, that you signed up with um, to watch the recording, as well as we're actually going to upload this to YouTube as well. So this will be living on our Pro Clinic website, um, as well as on YouTube. You can go back through Zoom, watch the recording, but shoot us an email, proclinics at ibsa.com. We can get you links and documents taken care of as well. Um, anybody interested in receiving those can email us there as well, and we'll reach out. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Next question here is, I understand that deep cycle and dual purpose batteries are different than they used to be. They are completely made. Um, they are commonly made maintenance free without removable caps. They are not serviceable. How do we re-educate consumers who've been trained over and over to check fluid levels on deep cycle batteries? Seems like we need a pro clinic on why doesn't my flooded deep cycle battery have removable caps? <laughs> That's very good. Very good. Is. So, Gail, I guess me and you both will tag team this one. So when we look yeah. at the, the dual purpose batteries, keep in mind, they, they start, they have capability of starting. They also have capability of deep cycling. They don't both do either one well. They can do them, but it's not well. So a true starting battery is going to be able to do nothing but start. Deep cycles will be able to do nothing but deep cycle, and that's lower amperage discharge for long durations of time. Those are traditionally a antimony chemistry, which antimony has been known over the years, of course, as uh, an extreme uh, water usage uh, battery. So you will have to do maintenance on those and check fluid levels. With the dual purpose, they're traditionally now a calcium calcium base, which calcium, it's a different way of gassing. Uh, so it doesn't use a whole lot of water over the lifespan. But once again, it's not designed to do uh, starting really well or deep cycle really well. It'll do them both, just not great. Um, Gail, what do you want to add in on that? Well, I would go back to the time that I started with interstate batteries just for a moment. And I know most of you weren't even born at that. Most of you weren't even born at that time. <laughs> but anyway, the, the point is when I first started, like Jeff said, we had lead antimony. It was an addition to the lead to uh, help it to work function better. What happened over time is that they gassed a lot. And so over time, one of the things that needed to be done in, the, in manufacturing of batteries was reduce that gassing. And so calcium, lead calcium came along and now even, even higher levels of of uh, purity with regard to that and different things has helped the gassing to go down to a point to where Jeff and I can utilize the term maintenance free. When, when it gets to a certain gassing level and Jeff can test this in the lab and has, and so if it doesn't have a certain amount of gassing under certain conditions of overcharge, it can be called a maintenance-free battery. So there is that terminology that is used in the industry. So we have maintenance-free batteries that don't need, do not need any additional water added to them over the period of, of its lifetime. Is that good enough, Jeff? Sounds like a winner to me. Hopefully that helped out. It's a good enough answer for me too, Gail. Um, <laughs> we'll move on. Next question here is, is sulfation on positive or negative terminals indicators of over or undercharging? Not necessarily. So we look at, um, you know, we, we keep talking about sulfation and, and what creates that. If the, let's just say you had a battery that you replaced because it died and, uh, you know, you, you use a wire brush and you clean the uh, eyelet connectors and everything off before you reattached it to the new one. Keep in mind, that wire brush is not getting into the pores of those eyelet connectors or the wire itself. So you still have acid containment in there. So if you're gonna be replacing a, an old battery and you're putting a new one in, 
make sure your connectors are good and clean. And by using a neutralization, whether it's with, um, you know, baking soda and water or your spray neutralizer, anything that's going to neutralize the pores within that uh, connector or wires, that's the way you're going to make this battery keep from corroding. Now, if if you do over torque or if you don't properly seat the um, uh, the caps to where it's not going to gas out, um, you know, you've got to make sure that you got a protector around those cables that are on the connector um, to make sure that you're not getting any more moisture back in on it. So I can't say that that's a, a reason, um, you know, that there is an issue with a battery if it's just on the, the cables. And again, Jeff, with and to add to that, sulfation itself, when, when uh, a battery is brand new, there's a certain amount of sulfation on the plates that has to be go through charging, discharging to a degree and keep the sulfation now off itself. If you take a battery and you, you don't use it, but seasonally in that situation, if you let it sit for an extended period of time without charging it, without maintaining it, without bringing it up, you will have sulfation on the plates inside that's created and you'll have less capacity. You will not have the capacity you need or that was on the label there because you allowed the battery to sit and, and uh, sulfate on the plates. I may be going too much in depth on that, but- Ain't nothing wrong there. <laughs> Jeff and I have seen it so many times. In fact, uh, we've, we have pictorials of that. And I think we've shown it on some of these pro clamps. Yes, sir. Awesome. Okay. Well, we just have time here for a couple more questions. I want to resurface one that Jeffrey Smith had asked. He said, I noticed you're saying manufacturer and not you. I feel like I might be missing something. Initially, the EFB was introduced as a battery with the performance of an AGM, but a price point closer to a wet battery. AGM is, to my understanding, the most forgiving of all, bat of all batteries to charging, so much that you can actually charge it on a gel charger or wet charger and it will perform well. Are you saying that you believe that the EFB's charging, quote, algorithm is not compatible with AGM regarding both auto and deep cycle? Deep cycle and AGM, I mean, uh, um, automotive are definitely going to be different. So the EFB product on the automotive side, um, you've got to remember that you're looking at a OE manufacturer that has built this vehicle around using a enhanced flooded battery, which is a wet battery and not an AGM. So they are uh, building these vehicles where the computer is controlling the alternator. So this is what's going to, you know, either make a battery last or make a battery fail. So in a case of an automotive application, we've got to make sure that if the OE is calling for an EFB battery, we put an EFB battery back in there. Uh, there are uh, studies that we've been dealing with where some of these OEs can actually deny a claim on a electrical component or alternator or, or whatever, if it's still under a warranty period on the OE side, uh, if it's got the improper battery in it. So we want to caution against that so we're not getting uh, caught in the middle of, you know, not having the right battery in the uh, vehicle itself. On the marine RV side, so keep in mind the EFB on a marine battery is different design than what it is on an automotive EFB. They are still designed with a carbon, uh, you know, chemistry built into it to where you're using less water and they also will perform, um, you know, at a partial state of charge throughout the life of them. But the build is different from marine versus uh, auto. So with the uh, EFB and the marine application, uh, I don't think, you know, I'm pretty sure, I, I, I'm, I know this because I've tested it, uh, the AGM charging parameter and a gel charging parameter will not bring a EFB battery back up to 100%. Uh, you know, the voltages are just too low. So there is a difference though. There's quite a bit of difference. And one of the things that I understood from this question was that you can charge an, an AGM via a liquid electrolyte charger, one that's just a regular charger, I mean, regular battery. One of the things that I would caution you about is using a 
charger that is made for liquid electrolyte on an AGM battery because AGM has defined parameters of charging voltage 14.4 to 14.8 or something like that. Don't go above that level of what it asks for or is labeled at. Okay, we'll squeeze in one last question here. If your questions have gone unanswered or if you think of any after the webinar, please email us at proclinics at ibsa.com. We'll get all your questions handled. Again, please feel free to share this recording out with whoever you may find the content interesting to. Last question here is noticing discolorization of water in the battery. Almost black in color. Some say it's not bad. I think there's an issue. What is your answer? So that's definitely a couple of things. It's either been overcharged or it's at the end of life. Uh, because as batteries are discharged and recharged, you are going to have uh, fragments of the paste material that will finally dissolve within that electrolyte solution. So you can change colors. I mean, it can go light gray to a dark gray, and that's just more chemistry uh, where it's got more paste material in the electrolyte itself. I agree, Jeff. You can, if you get too dark, if you see just a light skim of things, that's one, one type of scenario. But if you see a dark, real dark type liquid electro, in the electro, liquid electrolyte, no, that's not a good thing. Got it. All right, Jeff and Gail, appreciate you answering all these questions today. Um, as always, please register for the next Pro Clinic. Please check out our Pro Clinic site. Reach out to us directly with any questions. But until then, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you.